she's goal driven, she's determined, she's very smart. My wife has always impressed me. She's a very impressive person as a young lady and as a, as a, a mature adult person and going on to be a grandmother. There's a whole lot of people here that have always respected her. My name is Peggy Francis Scott, Francis being my maiden name, and um, I am not Otene Tachini, Tapahi, a Bashishin, specifically Nanisht Eja, not Dantl Gaiden Ned Rapahi, a Bashishin, Sendikin Edashiche, Kia Ani Edashinale. I was raised. Um, the the one hundred percent Navajo, so to speak. All of my relatives speak nothing but Navajo, and I was brought up among the elderly people. It was not just my mom and my dad that raised us. We were raised uh, in a village, so to speak. Everybody was responsible in. Uh, taking care of us and to make sure that we are taught certain things, that we are disciplined by our uncles, we are um, taught the traditional ways by our grandfathers, the stories and so on. My first language when I was growing up is Navajo and I went to Sebedalka High School kindergarten from I think when I was five years old they put me in school. My father um, demanded, did not ask or did not talk about or suggested or recommended or he demanded that I do very well in high school and that I have to go to college. That's how I really put myself into my education 100 percent and um, really became um, aggressive on things. Now the aggressiveness I learned from my grandfather. I didn't learn that from my dad. I didn't learn that from from my mom. It was my grandmother, my other aunts, and my grandfather. My grandfather would tease me and I sometimes I would cry because he, he was very harsh about it. He's the one that made me very aggressive and quick on my feet think fast, do things fast, and those are the teachings of the Navajo people. Don't be, you know, confused and making mistakes or whatever. Do things the right way, immediately. My father was the, the one that has really been the, the force in my life. He sat me down and he says, I'm going to send you to the school this is a private school, I'm going to pay for it. But always remember you're Navajo. You're a Navajo woman. Don't ever forget that. That you have your own traditional ways that we have shown you, that we have taught you, that we had you participate in. Always remember that. And if you ever become confused, pray about it. Remember, you have your your tradidin, your corn pollen. Go out there and pray. Get some dirt and use it, just like you do the the tradidin and pray. But the main thing is you pray. You talk to the Great Spirit about your problems, about yourself, and never ever forget who you are. The other thing is don't ever forget your language. Learn everything you can about the white man's way. Learn their ways, how they deal with things, how they think, how they talk. But you're Navajo. Don't ever forget that. And I always kept that. And he always used to say, what I'm telling you, put that in your purse and keep it there. As a child, Peggy's father sparked her interest in Navajo astronomy, which she continued to study long after finishing school. For an example, <clears throat> and again going back to my father, I, a lot of the astronomy stuff that I learned, I learned it from him. And he would um, 
uh, for an example, uh, we were sleeping and then one morning, early in the morning, he went out because we have no inside facility. He went out uh, and he comes walking back and you know how old people do when they're, they're, they're talking and making noise when they're coming back and that's what he was doing. And he said, and I, and I didn't, I never heard that word before. <clears throat> and I jumped up and I got a piece of paper and a pencil and I wrote it down. I said, what does that mean? And he said, just walk out that door and look to the east and there's that, <clears throat> that moon. That's what you call the Kaitahasal. So I did. I walked out and it was right to the east coast in this direction. So I said it over and over and I learned it. And uh, so I, I just learned the name, the name, the name. Finally, a couple of days later, I asked him, what does it mean? So he told me the story. It's a beautiful name for, for that particular moon. And so then he, he started telling me the phase of the moon. I do new moon, first quarter moon, second quarter moon, or half, or half moon, full moon, and so I have four moons there. I said, what are the names? And he says, this I know, a four And I said, well, that's according to the calendar. No, no, he says, a belagana. No, that's not our ways. You do 28 to 31 moons there. And I'll tell you the name of each one of them throughout the entire month. So that's what we did. When we were little, I remember at my grandmother's house, we would, you know, we, my grandmother would have mattresses and we just throw them out in the back of the truck. And she would lie down with us and we would look at the stars and she would name all these different stars, the stars that, the, the pictures that you see around the Hogan, you know, she took the time, even travel long distances from across the whole reservation to get a lot of this information, these diff these stories, the way they, the way it was told from, from the, the elderly people. Late at night, she would write it down again and re-look at everything and then finally translate it into English, the Navajo portion, and then from there look at the constellations and translate that as far as like, you know, the Orion, what is the Orion? In Navajo, this is what it means. This is the story of how this star was developed. And at each constellation, she knows every story of them. And like I said, we would lay there and she would try to remember, oh, okay, with this one, this is the story of this. We can only talk about it during winter time. So winter time, we're like standing out there, okay, okay. <laughs> every culture has a story about everything that is happening in the universe. Every culture has a name and a story that goes with constellations that they see, and so do we. Always an educator, Peggy places a high value on teaching the Navajo language to her children and grandchildren. I believe that pre uh, preservation of any language or any culture, any tradition, really starts in your own home. Being a uh, parent, a mother and father, you have to be the prime example to your children, which eventually, eventually will radiate to your grandkids as well. And it's that important to me, so I speak the Navajo language at home. I practice my traditions at home. I believe in every cultural stories that my father, my grand, grandmother, grand, the older folks tell me. And I relay everything that I know to my children, to my grandchildren. And I make it a point for them, I tell them, when I speak to you in Navajo, you answer me in Navajo. 
You may not say it right, but that's okay. I just want you to say it in Navajo back to me. Don't speak to me in English. With the school system, they do have different Navajo language programs where they come back and they're like, Mom, just like my son, he was like, I believe, five years old, first grade and five years old, coming back, Mom, do you know how to say a horse in Navajo? And I'm like, yeah, you say si. And he's like, okay, Mom, how about a cow? And I'm like, bakashi. And then he's like, Mom, how do you say chicken? And I'm like, tsidi. And he's like, no, that's wrong. And I'm like, no, that's right. And he's like, no, mom, you said it wrong. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, let's call your grandmother. Grandma, how do you say chicken in Navajo? And I said, tsidi. And he says, no, you're wrong. That's not how you say it. And that, that really struck me, and I said, okay, how do you say it? You know, challenging him, like, I'm right. How do you say it? He says, you don't call it city. You call it na'ahokhai. And my mom was like, oh, you are right. I was just thinking that they were just teaching you the general word for bird. And she, he was like, no, mom, no, grandma. There are certain words for certain animals. And you say you know how to speak Navajo? Long pause. And I said, you are absolutely correct. And I'm wrong. So to me, they're really wanting to know Navajo to the extent where they want to challenge me. And they want, to, they want to see if what they know is something that I know. So the, the, the word that he said is the proper word, but we never use that all the time. We just um, kind of ignore it and say it the easier way, which is city. And so, and that's, that's just a word for birds in general. But he was a very specific chicken or, you know, male rooster. The rooster is the male chicken in, in Navajo. So it's, I'm really happy about it. It really brings a lot of pride to, to me and my family. And I really hold my head up when I talk to my children, my children and grandkids in Navajo, and they're able to understand what I'm saying. Peggy was born when the Navajo Hopi land dispute was at its peak after the government ordered new reservation boundaries between the tribes. She made it a priority to do what was necessary to help preserve the relationship between the two tribes. Broken Rainbow is about the Navajo Hopi land dispute from a Navajo's point of view, how the lands were taken away by the U.S. government through the, by the Hopi tribe through the United States government. And there was a law that was made that divided, that physically divided the land in half. And so the land that the Navajo lands, the land that the Navajos used to live on that were given to the Hopi people are called the Hopi partition land. And the land that stayed with the Navajo is called the Navajo partition land. And I, I'm in the Hopi partition land and a lot of my relatives move across the fence to the Navajo partition land. And it was basically trying to stay on that land, trying to repeal that, that particular law that was done by the United States government to remove the Navajos off those lands that were given to the Hopi people. During the time when it was really erupting, my grandmother and my mother, my aunts, they didn't want to relocate. They were encouraging the children, their, their family, not to move, stay on this land because this is where we were, you know, we grew up, we know this land, the, this is where we uh, did our prayers, our, our ceremonies, this is where we put our corn pollen down, our sacred turquoise stone, white stone, this is where we made our offerings, this is where we buried our, our people that have gone before us. 
and these are all sacred places to us. I started advocating against relocation to the people, please stay on the land. So eventually a lot of the people from the Big Mountain area and the Tisto area got together and they started fighting relocation. And of course we've been married for, for many years by then and because I'm married to a Hopi. And by that time my husband was, was not considered by my family as a Hopi. He was just our son, our brother, our uncle. And here we are in the midst of this great big Navajo Hopi land struggle. Between my husband and I, there was never ever any conflict about what we stood for because his family, his relatives on the Hopi side are very traditional people. And what his grandmother told him was that it's not us that is fighting for this land. It's not us that are going out and, and causing all of this. We are peaceful people. We want harmony. We don't want anybody fighting. So, and the land is very sacred. Since you live out there, since you have your family out there, these are your children's land, you help out as much as you can. So there was never a conflict in, in our marriage because of the Navajo Hopi land dispute. Uh, we, we have been pretty, pretty happy throughout our lives, but there, you know, all marriages are, are not perfect. So sometimes we get into it and one day we did. Uh, we had a really huge disagreement and we stood there and in the middle of the room and um, disagreeing and yelling at each other and stuff and finally I got so mad I stomped off stumped off and I started walking down the hall I was so angry and I and I said in Navajo talking to myself and right by my ear right behind me real loud he says to me whatever you said same to you and I screamed and I, it, it scared me. And I screamed and I just hit the wall right there because it just really surprised me to scream. I, I thought he was still back there and he was following me. So we both just laughed about it and we, our, our argument was done and over with and gone because it, it, that's the funny side of being married to, to someone that is not of your tribe. <laughs> I just think that if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have uh, really become the person that I am, the human being that I am today. And because she taught me a lot about what it is to be myself, my own self as a Native American Indian. She's a very outgoing person. She's very caring, very loving person never turns down anybody when, she, when they ask for help and just humble, kind-hearted person. And if I could be her, I would, and I've tried. <laughs> and I still try, I try to, to be just like her, but you know, she's her own person and she's just really a, a a person to be proud of. Is a good in